So I was asked by Bob Palladino to talk about Mike Boyce. He said, you know, some of the classmates, I actually like to hear the stories about Mike. And uh, <coughs> you have to understand, when I came to Deerfield, it was so unique, it was so different. Because I came, and I mentioned this in my bio, I was coming from communist Poland, of all places, mm -hmm. where my father was a diplomat. Mm -hmm. And coming to Deerfield, you want to talk about being pie-eyed, <laughs> and just looking around trying to get used to this place was unique. And Mike became a friend, kind of like a surrogate father, particularly in the senior year when I was working with Bob DeWitt and others, Bob Bloom and all, on the yearbook. And he had, he was unique, there's no question about it. I remember one time, I think Alan Clow told me, uh, the dormitory in John Williams that we're all having a hullabaloo and making noise and voice stuck his head around the corner like, what's going on down there? And then starts walking down the hallway stark naked. And everybody, he said, Alan said, everybody just disappeared in the rooms, door shut, and that was it. Party was over. Um, at the yearbook, he was one of those professors who would actually say to you, are you 18? And you'd say, well, not yet. He'd be like, well, let's have a drink. You know? and, if you happen to be working late at night in that yearbook, he would invite you in. Uh, after Deerfield, after I graduated, I came to know him both in his place in uh, Hyde, I think Hyde Park, Vermont. He had a house up there. He was a real snowbird. So he was going from Vermont to Florida. He actually, in Florida, one of those hurricanes destroyed his entire house in his last year's retirement. He rebuilt his house. But the other thing was he, he was a survivor. And he had, I think, two triple heart bypasses. And I think all you doctors will know, you know, cartoid arteries uh, or carotid arteries, whatever they are, to the brain replaced. And uh, he turned to me one time and he said, well, I've just surpassed every member of my family in years. And I think he was only 62. And here we are, 67, 68, and we're thinking, as, and God bless Chris for that point, make every day count. And he did. And he would come down through DC, it would always be a pit stop sort of on the way down to Florida, take us out for days and God almighty, the brain cells we killed those nights. Um, just drink, you know, he, I mean, he would sleep like, I had a group house in college and he would sleep on the couch. And uh, one time he took uh, me and a friend of mine from Georgia to uh, he invited us to go sailing off the coast of Maine. Well, this is the 70s. We're no longer at Deerfield without, you know, casual college students. So we would bring some pot up there. And at five o'clock when the, is, he'd go, boys, it's five o'clock, cocktail hour. Then he'd look at us, he goes, are you going to get potted? And he came to, I mean, I got to know him just more and more because he was sort of like that father figure to me in a way. My own father being, I think in Deer, the four years I was at Deerfield, we moved four separate times, my family. The first year we were in Poznan, Poland. Second year, Monterey, California, where he was studying at the Defense Language Institute, studying Russian. Third year, Moscow. And fourth year, Leningrad, then wow. St. Petersburg. Uh, lovely places, but I don't recommend you go to Russia these days. And uh, he came to visit me in Tunisia. And by that time, we had three little kids. And he would just sort of sit on the couch and just look at them like they were little strange animals. You know? <laughs> And uh, be, be nice to them, you know. Yes, little boy, his name is Thomas. <laughs> and uh, in the very end, in Florida, he basically, he chose his time to go because he was under a dialysis. And I would come down and visit. By that time, he was pretty, he was no longer traveling. I always remind, you know, was reminded of the trips he would take, and maybe some of you were on them, and he would take students kind of like the students who didn't have real money and take them out in India. I don't know if he did practice there, but he did India, all right. And uh, in the end, by that time I was now serving in uh, 
in Brussels. He called me in 2008 and he basically said, well, I'm just letting you know, uh, I can't do this anymore and I'm gonna give up on the dialysis. And we had talked about this when I went my last visit to see him. And he said, someday I'm just gonna stop it. This thing is just too much for me. And I always thought that was kind of characteristic of him is that he chose his life, he chose to be a resolute bachelor. He loved Deerfield. Um, he loved to drop gossip about all the, the teachers every now and then, for those that were having fun misbehaving. And last but not least, but then he also chose when to go. And in some ways, sometimes that's the greatest gift that you can be given, is when you can go nicely into the next dimension. But I mean, he was my friend and I deeply appreciated him. And I deeply appreciate all of you, in all honesty. If you ever come through Washington, D.C., we can uh, bore you with diplomat stories and all that stuff. Okay.